I have been watching Mars exploration for the last 25 years, and I'm thrilled that this summer we have three different missions from three different countries going to Mars. We're going to focus today on Perseverance, which will fly no sooner than the 30th of July. This mission has a thousand people involved in it, a few of whom are shown here. Before though we talk about the individual goals of perseverance, it's a useful question to ask, why go to Mars? And there are three kinds of responses to that. First of all, we want to understand more about the history of the formation of planets in the solar system, which of course reflects on the history of the earth. In addition though, it asks the question, was there life on a different planet other than the earth? Could there be life there at some point? And what innovations would be required to solve the many difficulties that Mars presents us with and to explore that other planet, that new frontier? In this talk, we're going to focus on the last two, and that's going to be our focal point. Let's start then with life. Let's talk about whether there could have been life on Mars in the past. Is it possible that there's life now? And could we be the life on Mars in future? We'll start with the past. And you might wonder, well, how do we even answer the question, was there life on Mars? What evidence do we collect for that? Long before we could dream about sending people to Mars, a rock came a visiting, right? So there must have been a very large explosion on Mars, some large piece of rock from space, blasted rock from Mars out into space, traveled the distance between Mars and the Earth, and landed in Antarctica, where it probably stayed for a few thousand years. Before, in 1984, a group of scientists picked it up and it stayed in a lab and eventually people analyzed it and saw something very intriguing. They saw features that looked like fossils of microbacteria. After all, let's compare those with what bacteria look like on earth. They felt that um, they felt confident enough by all the evidence they put together that they made an announcement in a prestigious journal called Science in 1996 that they found evidence for life on Mars. Sadly, they had to take back that statement because it turns out that the features that they saw could be made were produced by not life by inorganic processes. So this is definitely. Um, you know, an interesting field. We're looking for what we call biosignatures, even though that didn't turn out to be a biosignature. We can't obviously sit around and wait for rocks to fall from the sky. We have to be more proactive. In the last 60 years, we have sent 56 missions to Mars, of which 26 have been successful. Five space agencies have been involved. Uh, obviously NASA, the European Space Agency, Japan, India, and the former Soviet Union or Russia. We have um, eight operational machines right now. Uh, there are three kinds. We have orbiters that are going around Mars. We have landers and rovers, machines that can move on the surface of Mars. Now, the very first successful flyby was in 1965, and that was Mariner 4. The first lander was a Viking 1. Viking 1 got to Mars on 1976, and it took this beautiful picture of the soil on Mars. And I don't know, I, I mean, think about this we took a picture of another world in 1976, amazing, and for Mars, really hard. More than half of the missions don't work out, right? So this was an astonishing achievement. 
which became even more obvious because it took us 20 years to do it again. Pathfinder got to Mars in 1997, and that mission included a little rover called uh, Sojourner. This was a proof of concept. We just wanted to see, could we make something that could rove around on Mars? And it became the parent, the grandparent, if you will, of the many rovers that came afterwards. Sojourner was about the size, a typical size of a, a banker's box, whereas Perseverance, the uh, rover that we're talking about today, is the size of a large SUV. Um, after Pathfinder, we had twins, Opportunity and Spirit. Opportunity, very soon after it landed in 2004, uh, managed to see evidence that Mars was a friendlier place to life earlier on. In this false image in the left, those little blue globules that we fondly call blueberries are in fact hematite that forms in large quantities of water, which would suggest that Mars was much warmer than it is now and that had a thicker atmosphere than it does today. Its twin sister spirit landed on the other side of Mars and it took the very first pictures of dust storms. And dust storms have caused us some anxiety because a dust storm might dump dust on the solar panels of our precious rovers. And if that were the case, it might cut off the energy source and the poor rovers might not be able to operate. But we found out to somewhat much our surprise and delight that sometimes the dust devils actually dust off, clear off the solar panels and allow the, uh, the rovers to have an extended life. For example, Spirit and Opportunities design um, length of life was 90 days and Opportunity survived for 14 years, much, much longer than anticipated. Their older sister, their bigger sister, was Curiosity, who landed on Mars in 2012, equipped with a serious lab on board, and it was able to crush rock so that they can analyze it in, in better detail. Sam made the new detections by heating samples of crushed rock to very high temperatures. This vaporized the samples and released several species of small hydrocarbons like benzene and propane. Because the hydrocarbons were released at such high temperatures, they may be the fragments of bigger, heavier molecules within the rock similar to kerogens. On Earth, kerogens are found in rocks like black shale and coal and are the products of ancient plant and bacteria. In the distant past, Mars was much warmer and wetter than it is today. The discovery of ancient organic molecules shows that another ingredient of life was present at that time, and it broadens our understanding of habitability of both ancient and modern Mars. So that is a question, right? Could there be life on Mars right now? Do we have any evidence? The answer is we do. If we measure the methane in the atmosphere of Mars, we see a seasonal pattern. We see that at the end of summer, early fall, the methane increases. Now, even on Earth, methane is a funny gas because it's so light, it would actually dissipate into space unless it was constantly replenished. And on Earth, what replenishes methane primarily are cows. So we're thinking on Mars, maybe that methane is connected to some geological process underground, but maybe there are microbacteria, maybe there's microorganisms in the soil of Mars that produces methane. And this is something that is tremendously interesting to us. And we are of course going to continue exploring this idea. But let's get back to why we're here today. We're here for the launch of Perseverance. Perseverance is a, a similar machine to Curiosity, only it has been uh, improved. So for example, the wheels have a brand new design. They've been designed to withstand 
uh, traveling over very sharp rocks on Mars. Curiosity uh, sustained some damage on the wheels. Uh, it also has 27 cameras looking backward, forward, underneath, um, so that it can navigate, self-navigate better. It also has a brand new system of coring rock so that um, this machine can put together some samples for a return mission to Earth in the future. There are four goals that this machine has. First of all, connected to geology, if you will, how habitable, habitable the environment on Mars was. We're looking for biosignatures. Let's find the fossils, let's find those bacteria, the signs that they left behind. The third goal is brand new. This is the most complicated system in the entire rover of caching samples. That is, you find the appropriate sample, you take it, and then you store it for a future mission to Earth. And for the first time ever, we're actually putting an explicit goal that we're preparing for humans to come to Mars. This is not happening today or tomorrow. We're still looking 20 years out or so. And guess what? We're also including a little helicopter in the belly of Perseverance. Uh, this is a proof of concept. We have never tried to fly anything like a helicopter on any other world. And Mars has a thin atmosphere. So there are lots of reasons why, in principle, this might not work. So we're hoping that it will. Uh, it was named by a high school student named uh, Veniza Rupani. And the machine is called Ingenuity. So let's see what we imagine it will do. jobs ingenuity has is to take pictures that will guide uh, perseverance to figure out where are the interesting places to get those samples that we would bring back um, that we would bring back to earth <clears throat> perseverance is going to land in Jezero crater this is an ambitious place to land it's not the usual, usually we choose something super flat and super uncomplicated um, to avoid any area with large boulders or something like that. But because the system, the landing system is so sophisticated, we think that we can avoid boulders if we find any. Uh, Jezero Crater looks like an ancient river delta. Um, look how, how comparable it is to the uh, the river delta of the Nile. And we know that on Earth, river deltas are teeming with life. I mentioned our second goal is to explicitly find signatures of life on Mars, what we call biosignatures. And it's hard to know what you're looking for, right? So we wanted to see what were the, what are the earliest biosignatures we can find on Earth? It turns out that those are in Australia and the crew, the team was shown stromatolites just to give them an idea of, of what they might look like on Mars. This is precisely the kinds of signs of life that we'll be seeking. The rocks you see right in front of me here, these wrinkly layered structures that we call stromatolites, structures like this actually represent fossilized microbial mass, basically fossilized pond scum in a sense. Microbes, bacteria living in a shallow water environment. And we believe that if life ever existed on Mars, it would have been purely microbial. As I mentioned before, this is the most demanding uh, aspect of the mission. Um, we're trying to identify, the first job is to figure out where are the most promising places to get rock, because frankly, perseverance is marvelous, but we couldn't possibly 
put all the chemistry kits that we would want to analyze every possible thing we could find on Mars. So the hope is that we find those very promising rocks that might carry, for example, biosignatures. We set them aside for a future mission that is intended to return to Earth. And then we could really analyze these at our leisure with the best equipment possible on Earth. And frankly, if we needed, we could build an instrument that was specifically for something that came from Mars. Uh, we're, we're not thinking this is going to happen before 2030, just to give you an idea of the time frame here. So we're wanting to prepare for humans. And to do that, we need to solve the oxygen problem, not only how astronauts would breathe, but also oxygen could um, suit us as fuel. It wouldn't be possible or practical to carry from Earth, not only the fuel that would take us to Mars, but also the fuel that would bring us back. The hope is that we could make oxygen on Mars that we would then use uh, with hydrogen to make the energy, the fuel that would bring us home. The experiment that uh, is being used as a proof of concept is called MOXIE. The Martian atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, a few percent nitrogen, a few percent argon, trace amounts of everything else. But there's still a lot of CO2, and so that's probably the most abundant resource on Mars other than dirt. CO2 has oxygen bound in it, and if we can liberate that oxygen from some of that CO2, then we can use it to do something useful. In the Martian, uh, there was something that was called the oxygenator. If the oxygenator breaks, I'm gonna suffocate. If the water reclaimer breaks, I'll die of thirst. So we jokingly refer to MOXIE as the oxygenator. It's unclear in the movie what technology the oxygenator is actually using, but it's very likely that it would be something like MOXIE, but scaled up. This is a proof of concept, right? So you put in carbon dioxide in the system, uh, you spend a lot of energy to heat up the machine to 800 degrees, which hopefully is enough to break the bonds between carbon um, monoxide and oxygen. And the idea is that this machine is gonna produce on the order of eight to 10 grams of oxygen. If this works in the harsh environment of Mars as expected, then the next step would be how to scale up the operation to produce the large amounts of oxygen that a crew would need and the fuel required for the return journey. When we're talking about sending people to Mars, we don't imagine that we you know, wave a wand and make Mars look like Earth. We're not gonna terraform uh, Mars. After all, even if we could produce huge amounts of oxygen, they would just spill out in space. We would have to design places that are enclosed to keep the atmosphere in and the low temperatures and radiation out. <clears throat> Many of you might have seen uh, The Martian the movie or read the book or both. And it gives us a good reference point to figure out what are the problems that we would need to solve before we could send people to Mars safely. So those are the ones that we're gonna look at. Starting from the lack of oxygen, I've already talked about MOXIE. So if MOXIE works, then we might well just do a scaling up of that to solve that problem. Food, of course, is another concern, right? Uh, it wouldn't be practical to bring all the food that you would need for months on end. And although blueberries sound good this time of year, the blueberries that I mentioned before are 100% rock. An interesting question is, can you grow food on Mars? Is that even, even possible? A university in the Netherlands uh, took some soil from Earth and made, if you will, soil that resembles the stuff on the moon and the stuff on Mars and grew various vegetables. The radishes here show that the Martian soil might be just as good as the Earth's and certainly better than the moon's. Now, in addition of establishing that it's possible, the next question is, is this food safe? 
We know that the topsoil of Mars would be radioactive, so you would need to remove that. Uh, there would that you would need to have some fertilizer, but maybe people can help with that. And finally, you would need to wash carefully the produce because the calcium perchlorite is toxic to humans, so we would need to, to get rid of it. Um, but there's another issue, and that is acceptability. You can imagine that engineered food uh, might be tolerable for a few days if all you're doing is zipping off to the moon and back. But if you're going to spend two years in space, then you'll have to think through what people are willing to eat for that period of time. Uh, imagine having so-called astronaut ice cream every day. Um, you, might, you might revolt. So um, people are working on all of these issues. Sadly, we all now know uh, some of the effects of isolation. In space, it's more profound because everybody you love is on a different planet. But in addition, there, there are long delays between communication. So let's say you have a problem at 720, it will take 20 minutes before that message is received in Houston. And it will be, even if they respond right away, it will be another 20 minutes before you get the message back. That means that from a problem that you have to any kind of response, it would be 40 minutes later. And depending on what kind of thing made you talk in the first place might be too late. I mentioned before that radiation is a problem on Mars. Um, we are designing a vest right now that hopefully will protect our bodies and our internal organs by getting bombarded with radiation. This vest is going to be tested on Artemis 1. Artemis 1 is the next series, is the first in the next series of machines that are going to go to the moon and uh, hopefully land people on the moon in 2024. On this mission, we're gonna use the vest and the dummy is going to have uh, instruments inside to measure radiation. And hopefully the dummy that's wearing the vest will have lower radiation measurements than the dummy that doesn't have a vest next to it. Um, the vest wouldn't be sufficient on the, on the ground, right? On the ground on Mars, you would definitely need a suit, a spacesuit. Uh, the spacesuits that we saw more recently uh, were worn by Doug and, and Bob, who went up to the International Space Station on the SpaceX. Um, let's remember that the International Space Station is pretty close to the Earth, and therefore is still protected by the magnetic, by the by the magnetosphere of the Earth. Um, that suit would not work if you were on Mars. That's too, you, you would get too much radiation. You would probably need something much closer to what the astronauts wore on the moon. Um, here is Neil Armstrong's spacesuit from Apollo 11, which looks pretty cumbersome. This is the new one that's being designed for the Artemis mission, but also hopefully it will serve for the Mars vi uh, visit probably sometime in the 2040s. This looks pretty cumbersome also, but it has some major improvements. It has a much better communication system. It has better backup um, machinery systems, especially life support has, if something fails, there's a backup and there's extra oxygen in the backpack too. So that will allow loud, uh, longer uh, missions. Finally, the, the um, joints of the astronauts will be freer to move both in the elbows and the knees. And it's good because these, these, these suits are pretty cumbersome. That's Jack Schmidt um, on Apollo 17. Because they're so cumbersome, we're designing uh, bio suits. This is a work in progress at MIT, David Newman, has made a suit that hopefully provides the pressure where we need it to survive in a low atmospheric pressure environment. 
on the right side, you see the complete suit for outside on Mars, including the oxygen supply. Any suit that you have still isn't a substitute for a home. And we definitely would want to have enclosed spaces like I mentioned before. There have been several experiments around the earth for the last 10 years or more now, where people take a small uh, group of people in an environment that's enclosed, isolated with limited resources, limited energy, food, water, communication, to see how people do. High seas is one of these environments. It's been used now for several years. The latest one was in January where six women were studying the psychological impacts of space exploration. We'll see the interior of the space, uh, both the working quarters and also the living quarters. And um, I find this amusing. Um, this is all the food that a group had for three months in 2013. I have two teenage boys and I don't think we would get through one month on that amount of food, but in any case, I digress. We would hope that the house or the home that we would have on Mars would be built before anybody arrived. To that end, a 3D printer comes in very handy. Um, the design you're looking at here is called Marsha. It is a 3D printed um, home. It also includes natural light because people realize that that's very important in the psychological well being of people in space, especially for long periods of time. One of the prototypes uh, has been built in New York State, and I guess you can stay there if you wish. There are various places on the planet that have um, simulated Mars environments. This is, for example, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And on the left, you might recognize him. He's one of the few people who have stood on the moon. Uh, Buzz Aldrin seems to be enjoying a 3D experience on Mars. There's also such an environment in Spain called Astroland and in China, Sea Space. So hopefully you've uh, grasped now that for us to send people to Mars, we will need to solve many problems. Um, large groups of people are gonna need to think of innovations to, to address some of these. I'm happy to say that UWM is also part of that effort. I'll, I'll uh, mention three here, people specifically. Janice Eels is an expert in um, eye injuries, and she found that injuries induced from radiation in space can be uh, healed or certainly improved with infrared radiation, which by the way, also helps with macular degeneration on earth. Rani El Hajar studies uh, composites for 3D printing that are suitable for space applications. And, uh, and finally, Nathan Solowitz's group uh, is looking at self-healing metals. Because a spacecraft that spends months to get to Mars is certainly gonna be hit by micrometeorites, it would be useful if the spacecraft itself knew, ah, I've got a little injury here, fix itself on its own. And Basically, all of these, these are kind of a, a list, a short list of the kinds of things that we would need to do. You know, we would need to have um, food production that's sustainable, trash management, uh, health applications, all of these things, solutions to these problems, not only would enable us to open a door to another world, but it would also improve our life on earth which makes space exploration for me very exciting. I would go amiss not to thank the College of Letters and Science at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology and Astrophysics for their support for our programming. And of course, thank you 